uh, Colton Steinbaugh with the next episode of the Inspire podcast. Uh, today we're doing something really special, uh, kicking off a new series on women transforming manufacturing. And we couldn't think of anybody better to be our inaugural guest for this series than Allison Grayless, the uh, president and I believe co-founder or founder of Women in Manufacturing, uh, one of the largest organizations uh, supporting women in manufacturing. Uh, so, Allison, thanks so much for joining us on this this kickoff episode. Um, and we've also got Dana Aerosmith. How are you doing, Dana? I'm doing well this morning. Thank you. All right. And, uh, you know, that said, we're really excited to jump into the conversation. So, Allison, I know I gave you a little bit of a promo there, um, but uh, would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself, who you are, and maybe just a bit on uh, women in manufacturing before we really start the deep dive? Sure. So, uh, my name is Allison Grayless. I am the founder and president of the Women in Manufacturing Trade Association, as well as our Education Foundation. So we have um, both our traditional trade association, which is a member-based organization that year-round aims to support and promote and inspire women in manufacturing careers. And then our education foundation is specifically focused on education and training for women in manufacturing careers, um, specifically with an aim to look at the necessary resources and uh, tools that are either existing or non-existing um, to help develop those for women to advance and rise in manufacturing. And my background, I've been in trade association work for 20 years. I first started working with the Precision Metal Forming Association, PMA. I uh, started with them and working with their chapters and districts all throughout the country. And then um, grew to many roles and responsibilities with them and actually left them in November um, with an official transition date of April 1 as now a fully dedicated president to women in manufacturing. I've been doing both for 10 years and I'm very excited to now be the to be solely dedicated to the Women Manufacturing Association. So mobilizing large groups of manufacturing professionals for the greater good is nothing new to you. Right. <laughs> okay. yeah, that's great. And then Dana, how about a, a few quick notes on you? I, I think you're a recent addition to the, the Women in Manufacturing community. Is that right? I, I am. And it has been so welcoming that I have uh, taken the role of secretary for Mid-Tennessee for the new chapter that we're starting off. Um, so it's been a great time to join women in manufacturing. Uh, we just conducted a summit that was spectacular, um, had lots of good networking and information, especially for me being new to the organization. I was thrilled to be a part of it. And um, I'm just looking forward to see how we grow the Tennessee chapter. Uh, fantastic. All right, so, you know, Allison, kind of diving into the history of women in manufacturing a little bit. I think you gave, you know, a couple of really good primer points there on, on kind of being the, the founder and, you know, the, the size and breadth of the organization. Um, but what are the, the different discrete ways, you know, day to day um, that women in manufacturing kind of, you know, helps promote women in the, the manufacturing workforce and in the different ways that people can get involved, uh, ultimately that help the, the greater business community. Yeah, so our organization was founded on the principle that it's important for women to have a community. So our goal is to connect women with peers and colleagues who are in manufacturing careers that they can network with, that they can share resources with, and most importantly, feel supported by one another. Um, you know, we think of it almost as a sisterhood of women in manufacturing careers that uh, when I first got started, much of the impetus for the organization was I had the great opportunity to work with a lot of small to mid-sized business owners and leaders in small privately held metal forming companies. And so many of them were the only one or one of just a few women within their organizations. And often they felt isolated and they, they lacked this knowledge of who else is out there who's dealing with these same common issues and challenges. So we were founded on this principle of building a community 
for women in manufacturing and year round, that's really what we're focused on. So providing women access to that community through an online portal, helping them now have access to 26 local chapters throughout the country where they can locally network and find new connections and share information. And then nationally, we work with a handful of corporate partners in a, in a more intensive way than just a traditional membership. And we work with those companies to really share best practices. So companies of all different sizes can join women in manufacturing and, and then learn from kind of the best and brightest as to the strategies that they're deploying to recruit women, to advance women, and to help retain their female talent. So year round providing lots of resources. Um, obviously much of what we did prior to pandemic was live. So we have quickly now transitioned to delivering all of our benefits and services through a virtual component. So our chapters, including Tennessee, are all kind of pivoting and now delivering this value of what would have been a live meeting in a virtual way. Um, and we ourselves as a national organization have taken any of our live programs and put those on pause for the safety of our members. And we're now delivering virtual events. So our summit, which Dana referenced, is our big annual meeting. We just conducted that two weeks ago and had record attendance. And I think one of the benefits of the pandemic has been that it's really helped us to reach more people. So we've always really aimed to, to represent and to connect with women at all levels of manufacturing. But women in production have been really the most difficult women to reach because we know they have more constraints on their time. They don't often have hefty travel budgets, sadly. Some of, many of them don't even have emails. So how best can we reach them? So now going to a virtualized delivery of services have really helped us to get into to other layers of women in manufacturing, which has excited us. Yeah. No, and we'll, we'll dive into to the logistics of that event in a, in a little bit. Obviously, we've got a, a pretty broad manufacturing audience in the, the marketing sphere. I think they're going to be very interested on some of the lessons learned there. Um, but let, let's unpack a little bit like the, the different industries. Obviously, manufacturing can be so broad. Um, you brought up, you know, metalworking, obviously, incredibly important. What are some of the other key industries that, uh, well, I guess maybe sub-industries that women in manufacturing, you know, works to build the support network around? Yeah, we work with many different verticals. So when I first started the organization, um, I had a background with the Precision Metal Forming Association with working a lot with the automotive industry. So we work a lot with kind of the automotive vertical. We work with appliance, we work with off-highway, we work with medical, um, technology, electronics. So really we're connected to all of them. And what we've tried to do is to foster discussion groups or kind of micro networks within our, our organization for those women to connect. So if you're in food manufacturing, um, we try to connect those that are in uh, similar verticals and segments so that they can network with those. We also partner with a lot of other organizations. So there are other organizations completely dedicated just to women in aerospace, for example, or just to women in defense. Uh, it sounds like maybe that'll help increase the velocity to reach all these different different areas. So that's that's a pretty exciting time. Um, you know, so so one of the things we've hit on a couple times is the fact that, that you're the founder here, but it sounds like how, how do you find the time or maybe better the inspiration? Because, you know, we as, as manufacturers and a lot of our audience, we're very familiar with a lot of the big industry associations. Um, you know, the metalworking association you came from is an extremely prominent one. How do you find the time and inspiration to found something like women in manufacturing while still doing that up until very recently? Like what's, what's that moment? Like, is there a story or was it a series of things that, that brought you to really, you know, I, I guess want to create this? Yeah. So I, I think a few things. So I've always been personally, personally passionate about women's issues. So from a very early age, I was connected to um, female initiatives. I went to an all girls private school, which I think um, helped to even further uh, kind of foster and develop my passion and interest in supporting women's based organizations and, and helping to find women the opportunity and help to, them to connect and collaborate together. So having kind of a very um, serious passion around that, I was active both in high school and college and women's organizations. And to me professionally, I went to grad school, I got my master's in public administration. I knew I always wanted to work um, most likely in the public sector or elsewhere not for profit, um, specifically with a common um, cause based organization or mission driven organization. So to me, uh, to find my first job at a trade association, I loved the opportunity to work for 
family-run businesses, small to mid-sized companies, very pat work with very passionate manufacturing leaders. And it was great to meet these women who were connected to these small to mid-sized privately held companies. Um, we had at PMA our first female chairperson, Gretchen Zierick, who went during her chairmanship as our chairperson in 2010, she was very passionate around building a community of women in metal forming. And I had many long conversations with Gretchen about the power of this small women in metal forming group and, and how could we expand this into something much larger. And so that's kind of the impetus was getting to kind of marry professional acumen and experience with working with a trade association with this personal passion I had around women's issues. So for me, I, I feel like I almost have to pinch myself because I get to work in this, this perfect place every day where I love to support women. I love to help see them advance and to give them the right resources to do so. But I'm also equally passionate about entrepreneurship and ingenuity. Um, so getting to work with manufacturing companies who are, are creating, building, and making some of the most amazing products and services that our globe needs in this current time, and especially given this current pandemic. So feel very blessed. And I, I think it's um, one of those opportunities that you asked about my kind of doing this as a day job for many years. Uh, it was a challenge for 10 years to, to serve as both a vice president of a 70 year old trade association who is about five times the size of WIM um, in terms of longevity and budget and all that kind of things. And they had very unique needs. And then to couple that with the unique needs of women in manufacturing. So it has been um, a very interesting time to transition to this full time come April 1 in the midst of a pandemic. But it's also given me the great luxury of not being on the road. I normally travel every single week. Um, I would normally be at many industry conferences. So to get to, to be more thoughtful and kind of in the weeds of the business right now and less um, disrupted and less distracted has been, again, a blessing. And I feel like um, you know, my family's been blessed not to be affected by the pandemic, and I know many people have struggled, and most manufacturing companies were essential businesses, so they haven't had that disruption in business or in, in kind of the daily work. So for me, it's been a great time to be able to plug into the business to transition um, and look at lots of opportunities for improvement and efficiency and expansion of our services. Well, it seems like there's just so much alignment there, and, and it's funny, whenever we really talk about, you know, somebody's origin story, it always starts with that like passion from a very young age. And then as things progress, like you said, you got to pinch yourself, but like you almost wonder is like, is it saying maybe you make your own luck or you, if you seek, you'll find it. I, I don't know. You know, I'm sure random chance probably had a part, but you know, it's always interesting. That seems to be the connective thread and tissue is like, no, I, I was passionate about this. I didn't realize maybe, but I was passionate about this before I even got started, you know, which is incredible. Now, as I, so as I think about that, right, so the, you know, in, in master's in public administration, you know, you know, you want to make a big change and, and enter the nonprofit sector. I mean, that, that itself is very broad. And I think that this is probably a, a kernel that, that might be really interesting to a lot of women who, who maybe are thinking about entering a career in manufacturing, how do you go from broad wanting to, to really help the greater good, you know, advance women's causes, and then choose to do that in the world of industry, right? You could have went anywhere, but that's where you ended up. What, what brought you to the, the industrial or manufacturing world? Well, I think I like a challenge. <laughs> so I, I think one of the, the most, um, exciting and interesting facets of the work that we're doing is that we are a challenged industry. I mean, manufacturing is still very male dominated. We still have some need for a transition and, and change and modernization of manufacturing cultures in many instances. So I, I think I like the challenging piece of it. And, and I think it's where kind of my, my, my passion, I think was needed most at that juncture in time where there was an underrepresented community that was lacking resources that needed um, kind of some mobilization and, and needed help in, in connecting kind of the people together who were passionate about this cause. So, I mean, I had a great advisory board that helped us when we first got started. They were women from large size companies with many years experience, as well as women from small, some of the small to mid-sized metal forming companies that really helped shape the direction of the organization. When we got started, we could have done lots of different things. And we had tons of people coming to us saying, hey, we want you to focus on K through 12 education, or we want you to work with campus recruiters. And, and our board really helped me figure out we can't be everything to everyone. 
that we could probably be most effective if we narrowed our scope and the scope of our organization still remains the same as it was back then 10 years ago, which is to look at women in manufacturing careers. So to take those women who've already found their way into manufacturing and help them advance, develop, rise, and be successful. And we work with lots of other partners who work on the recruitment and, and the attraction pieces. We work with Girl Scouts regionally and nationally. We work with lots of other engines that are really successful at their recruitment piece. Um, but we see our greatest success and impact being in those areas of women who have already entered into a manufacturing career and helping them to be um, the best that they can and help them have the largest career that they want to have. And, and personally, manufacturing, I'd, I'd always been aware of manufacturing. It's not something, again, I think if you talk to most people in manufacturing, they don't normally have a direct line to say, gosh, from age five, I knew I wanted to make things and that led me into manufacturing. You know, unfortunately, we have a long way to go in, in exposing parents and kids and, and students to manufacturing careers and the opportunities that they offer. And so I like, like kind of a similar individual, you know, I don't think I was ever exposed to much about kind of manufacturing options or careers or applications. I did in college, I had a few roommates and good friends who were chemical engineers and mechanical engineers. So some of them went off to work at Goodyear and they went to work with manufacturing companies. So I had exposure there. And then my father, we moved from upstate to New York to Akron, Ohio, the rubber capital. And um, he had worked for Firestone Tire and Rubber. So I was aware of um, kind of rubber manufacturing and his role that he had in sales. He wasn't directly on the shop floor in production, but I was aware very vaguely um, of opportunities. And so again, I think the alignment has been amazing to get to work in manufacturing um, to help individuals that are technically inclined or those that are connected to other facets of manufacturing. Absolutely. Dana, can I pick on you for a second? Absolutely. Okay. So, you know, Allison just, just just dove into what brought her into manufacturing. Obviously, you work, well, a lot of the audience already knows where you work, but Dean Houston, right? So we're a, a marketing and communications firm that is entrenched in manufacturing. Obviously, you are part of the Women in Manufacturing organization. How the heck did you get into manufacturing, right? I think these are really good stories for the audience. Yeah, you know, it was interesting because early in my career, I did a lot of consumer-based marketing. And then I really once, and the founder of our company helped kind of pull me over too because he was so fascinating to talk to. I thought I can learn a lot from him. And I do love the technical aspects of what we do. And, you know, I've always been kind of, I love puzzles, I love problem solving. And I think at its heart, manufacturing, you know, has a lot of that. And it has also a really strong, you know, understanding of the customer, which I think is highly aligned with marketing. So the more I got into, you know, working with manufacturers to help solve their marketing challenges, the more excited I got about manufacturing, but you do feel sometimes like when you go to some shows, you may be there. Well, this may need to be edited out later, but um, you do, you know, there's no line at the women's bathroom ever. Right. <laughs> and it actually becomes a joke. And you do feel like you gravitate at those events toward the other women in the crowd. And, and there is this sisterhood so as soon as I found out about women in manufacturing, I was like, that's it. And interestingly, Colton, a lot of the younger women that I've spoken with within our company and within clients it, have been really excited to learn that there's an, an organization that supports women in this male dominated, um, you know, field because with, you know, you really get true innovation in diversity of thinking. And so I think we all understand that and the, the science behind that um, and the art behind that. And I think that's why this is so exciting to uh, kind of embrace and support women in this industry. Well, I, love, I love that through both of your stories, it seemed like the through line was, well, there, were, there was passion, passion at the beginning and then I noticed it was a challenge and that got me really excited yeah you know so that uh, yeah that's 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 phenomenal and and I know we're gonna jump around to the the order of questions here but you know Dana you painted a very vivid picture and and Allison I'm sure that we've 
whether we know it or not, we've probably been at the same trade shows a couple times floating around. Um, you know, and, and I've been attending these trade shows, you know, in the industrial space for about 10 years now. Um, and I have noticed things seem to be changing a little bit. You know, I think, you know, it, I will admit, you know, I was probably one of the, the people to notice when I first started, huh, I've got to wait 15 minutes to use the bathroom and the, there's no line at the women's room. And it's, that's completely opposite to most places that I go to, you know, so that uh, is very interesting, but you are starting to see that change, you know, and I, and I obviously it's a fantastic thing, you know, but maybe diving into that a little bit, right? So, so the idea here and, and Allison, I think this is kind of paramount and testament to your mission, you know, but depending on what study you look and, and what organization you're looking at, you know, women make up just over 50% of the United States workforce, but no matter the source you cite, it's, it's less than 30% in manufacturing. Um, obviously, and, and this is just anecdotally, it really seems like that's changing, but, but what do you attribute those things to and, and how do you see them changing? Yeah, I mean, I, I think so. I had I had many years of similar trade show experiences to Dana, and um, you know, I'd go to the largest trade shows each year, and I heard even from my members, you know, that their trade show experience was sometimes not the most positive. That that they were not thought of. I mean, these were owners of companies that were 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 ready and primed to buy equipment and would not even be approached in a booth um, because they didn't look like what a typical owner of a company or someone with purchasing power look like. So I do think things have improved in the past 20 years that I've been working in trade association work and going to trade shows. I think you see more and more women who are attending shows and more and more women who are leading exhibiting efforts. Um, more people attending who are females. Um, so I, I do think that the situation's improving. I, I do think there's still a long ways to go. And that's what our organization always says. You know, when we first started our work, I think women made up about 27% of the manufacturing workforce. So we've hopped a whopping two percentage points in our 10 years of work. Um, but what we look at is even a, a more powerful barometer are women's positions. So while we care about the, the raw numbers of women in manufacturing careers, the goal is to get those women two powers of leadership, because with women leaders, that is where you directly can impact the culture and the hiring practices of an organization, where you can change kind of the inclusivity and uh, kind of the statements around and, and the real um, execution of how uh, companies deal with female and diverse candidates and female and diverse um, talented individuals in their organizations. So our goal is to rise more women to the top and to get more women in positions of power and decision making and manufacturing careers. And so as we look at our formal leadership programs, that's our key goal and objective is to, to, to give these women the managerial and leadership skills that they need to rise the ranks and to, to be kind of top decision makers at organizations. Um, so I think it's improving. I, I think as you look at attraction, one of the key challenges is individuals not understanding those career opportunities in manufacturing. So our chapters are very active at local at the local level with community colleges, with K through 12 organizations, um, with other like-minded groups to help with the attraction piece. Um, we ourselves produce a story and series called Hear Her Story. So we've now profiled more than 100 women to talk about a day in the life of their career. We posted on our blog and then in 2021, we're really excited because we're starting our own podcast. Um, with, which will specifically focus on taking that hear her story interview it and making it live so a real life conversation with these women in manufacturing careers and the stories are so amazing i mean so many of these women they first started at the hourly ranks they were working at the shop floor they were um, a tool and die maker they could be an engineer uh, they could have uh, many different roles and ways that they started and now are leading global operations and some major responsibilities within manufacturing companies and it excites me when we get to share their story. And the goal is that these stories trickle down to women and to other individuals who are thinking about, gosh, what do I do with my life? Where do I apply these skills and this passion that I have? And we hope to try to direct them to apply that to a manufacturing career. Okay. No, I, I think when you, you look at that, like talking about, you know, advancing through the ranks, like that awareness piece, like you were, you know, talking about the podcast that you're about to start and that hear story initiative like even the, the awareness of knowing that, that there are jobs past the production floor, you know, and, and that awareness, I mean, 
you know, obviously I, I, I can't relate to the, the female component, but until I really understood and, and my, my father was in the automotive space, that was my impression of manufacturing, right? So, so the fact that you're out there telling those stories, I mean, that's an incredible thing, you know, and, and I was going to ask you what, before we, we dive into some of the recent initiatives that, that women in manufacturing is running and, and the, like the hall of fame and your recent event and your future events, I'd like to ask you, and, and I think again, we've been getting pieces of this throughout the whole conversation. Like some of the, th what are some of the things you're most proud of and, and some of the things you look back on, you know, and put the biggest smile on your face when you think about your women in manufacturing journey and where, where you've built and brought the organization. Yeah, I, I think, you know, I would say our community's growth has been one of the most exciting pieces and what gives me huge delight when I look at our growing numbers of members that we've got. Um, the fact that we've now grown from not just the United States, but now to overseas and having people in 11 countries, um, multiple countries represented as part of our membership. So I think the expansion really makes me excited. And to see our pie chart change and continually shift to be more representative of not just those at a manager level and above, but those at different levels and to see our growing slice of people that we're serving who are in production really excites me. And I think our new Empowering Shop Floor Women's program that we're launching next year will continue to help us reach more women in production and women in operations who really probably need us most, who, who are, who are you know, in a position that's usually in an hourly rate and not really sure, gosh, what do I take with this skill set that I've learned and how can I apply it to that first line of leadership? So really excited there. I would say probably one of the most impactful things that I've seen over the course of the years is our formal leadership programs. So I get really excited when I, I still stay in touch with our first class that graduated from our Leadership Institute, which used to be called our Leadership Lab for Women in Manufacturing. It was the only and still is of its kind in the country. And that first class of around 20 individuals that graduated, they've done such amazing things since completion. So one of our inaugural members was at the time an office admin. So she was supporting a small to mid-sized company. She um, was gaining confidence in her role and her skill set. And just last week, she signed the papers to become one of the co-owners of that company um, just in six years after completion of the class. So that at first class, and I talked to them often, I mean, some were in one woman as well um, who was a graduate of that class. She was in quality. She had um, kind of a mid-level position in quality. She's now a senior director in her area of operations for GE Appliances. So again, it, it's giving women the skill sets and the support they need, making sure they have access to resources. Part of that program as well is coaching, assessments, evaluations. A first class that we graduate and just see that almost all of them have been promoted, they're, they're at higher levels of leadership, and then we're looking and tracking that for all of our other classes from years after to see, okay, what has been that impact? And are, are, we, are we getting those results we want, which is for women to rise, advance, and be successful? Well, and, and yeah, I mean, last time I checked, they don't really have upward mobility in mid-sized manufacturers and part of any uh, colleges or, or educational program formally, you know, right. so like that gap there, you know, and while some of the anecdotal stories you, you told us there speak for themselves. I mean, I, I would imagine a couple of those individuals might have their stories out there either already or sometime soon, just guessing, but yeah. uh, yeah, well, we'll make sure you reference some of those things in the show notes. Yeah. Dana? If, you think, if you think about leadership in general, there's a serious dearth of leadership training, you know, that no matter, even outside of manufacturing, the things that make you good at what you do don't always make you a good leader. Right. And I think that's especially true within the manufacturing industry. So this kind of training is critical to the future of the industry. Absolutely. You know, and again, it's, it's noticing like that there's a problem there and then aggressively solving it. I mean, it, it, it's, it's incredible. Um, you know, so Dana, I'm going to pick on you again here because I, I completely expect you to give a, a fair and balanced, completely honest, non-biased report, but, but shifting into some of the things that women in manufacturing have done recently. You mentioned that you just attended a pretty large scale virtual summit. And this is where we're gonna shift a little tactically, you know, cause we do have a lot of marketers in the audience trying to figure out this virtual event. Right. 
How was that event as an attendee? And like I said, completely fair and balanced. Pay no mind that uh, the president of the organization is listening. <laughs> yes. What was your experience through that event? I will block Allison's picture on my screen. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it was really well done. And I'm not just saying that because I'm a member. It, um, it, and this is honestly the first bigger uh, event that I've attended. The thing that I liked about the Women in Manufacturing uh, Summit was that there were, you know, there was a combination of pre-recorded material, especially when you're engaging such a large group of people um, pre-recorded does play a role, especially I think it gives your technical team a little little break occasionally. Um, but it was pre-recorded, it was large group, it was small group. I mean, the small group stuff was incredibly impactful to me, whether it was listening to um, a CEO of a, of a manufacturing company talk about inheriting the company from her father and what she's done um, to kind of innovate and, and expand the culture within that company. It was really impactful. Um, there were less than 10 people and I could ask a ton of questions and they, they're all women that have a, a lot of experience in, in the field and were so willing to share their expertise that it, it was really good. All right. So, Allison, I, I got to ask. So it sounds like from Dana's, you know, experience, everything went very, very smoothly. I can imagine it was a completely stress-free exercise getting this all ready, right? You know, I, I and and reason I ask is like, what are the what are the big insights you have, like, on running an event at that scale virtually, with everything going on? So it was an experience. Uh, so, you know, our goal was to celebrate our 10th anniversary of our, our summit um, in Cleveland, Ohio, where we first got started. Obviously, things shifted and were delivered a bit differently. And we ended, I think, with, with close to 700 was our final number attendees to the event, which, again, was a huge increase from years prior. So I would say the complexity or, or the challenging pieces was that we really, to Dana's point, we're trying to keep it interactive. So one of the things that people say when they come to our live summit is that it's, it's a very unique conference. It's very different than other manufacturing conferences that you would go to. Um, it's just more collaborative, the energy, the enthusiasm, the, the I think that the schedule as we've designed it is just a real experience. And so we were trying to, to create a uniquely beneficial experience virtually, which is a little bit more challenge, challenging to do. You know, a virtual platform in and, in and of itself is a bit sterile. So we had to work on how do we create interactive experiences through, um, you know, using group breakouts and using discussion topics and, and having interactive workshops that were delivered virtually. So I think, um, again, this was our first big event that we had done in this virtual type of component. And so we, we had lots of lessons learned and we've taken lots of notes. Um, we have two other big regional conferences coming up in 2020. So we're focused on kind of taking those notes we received from our big conference and making modifications as necessary for those two. And really the feedback we heard from people is um, they wanted more interactivity. So more virtual networking, um, more kind of connectivity with attendees. Um, so we're going to try to build more of that into our next two programs um, that we hold later this year. So again, I think, you know, we saw some things that we'd like to tweak and, and again, the feedback was really useful. Um, but I think all in all, we were proud of the, the first ever virtual summit we delivered. That uh, I, I, I think I remember seeing this somewhere, but you guys cracked the four figures in attendance, right? So... We were close, I think, well, the on-demand access, yes. I think live into the platform, we were at like 600 and, and almost 80 people that were live on the platform. As, as somebody who works in digital marketing and helps manage the technical side, that is the type of things that would give me nightmares. So congratulations <laughs> to you and your team, because that is, that is no small feat. Um, so you had, you had mentioned, um, you know, a couple other events coming up. Um, what are some of those that, so our audience can, you know, get, get their pen and paper ready and, and well, or maybe just visit womeninmanufacturing.org to learn more. It's probably more realistic, but, uh, what are some of those events? 
So we have a Northern Conference and a Southern Conference that we have now held for multiple years. We normally hold those, hold those regionally where we try to engage the local and regional manufacturers to participate in plant tours and sharing their expertise. Um, this year we have shifted and obviously you're doing that virtually. So our Southern Conference is in just two weeks and that will highlight Southern based manufacturers um, with some vertical focuses on automotive and food manufacturing and others. Um, so we try to make each of these regional conferences, again, highlighting localized manufacturing, local manufacturing leaders and knowledge experts, and then as well bringing in expertise on kind of the state of manufacturing in those markets. So our Southern Conference, again, is in two weeks. It's virtual. Um, the, the interesting component with our Southern Conference, our Northern and our Western, all of these regional conferences, is that there are some elements as well that are directed just to the attendee. So there's personal coaching that's involved that's optional for those programs. So again, while many people are supported by their company to participate, we're also trying to build in some personal development components to each of those programs. Um, so that the full agenda for Southern is online. We have some outstanding speakers. Um, we're also working in virtual plant tours as each of these are going live. So we would have normally had optional plant tours. So those are virtualized. And then our Northern Conference would normally be in Dearborn. So again, um, lots of automotive participation. Uh, that is in virtual, uh, our virtual world in December. And then our Western Conference is the first ever we're doing a Western Conference. That is happening in early part of 2021. And there'll be a heavy focus on technology, aerospace, electronics, defense. And um, right now we're just building the agenda for that conference. Uh, I think that is the most firsts that I've heard in 2020 from one person. <laughs> so you know, that's, that's, that's incredible. Um, you know, another recent thing, you know, that, that, that we'd love to learn a little bit more about is I believe there is now a Women in Manufacturing Hall of Fame. Is that, is that correct? Correct. We had our first induction. We created the Women in Manufacturing Hall of Fame. We had our first 15 women inducted on October 1st. Uh, we did so virtually and they are just outstanding women. So their profiles can be found on our Education Foundation website. So we have um, them as our first class, and right now we're open for nominations um, for next year, for 2021, for women to be um, considered for uh, induction into the next year's Hall of Fame. So the plan right now is that we'll induct, um, we'll celebrate both last year's class live as well as the 2021 class um, live in Cleveland next year when we host our 11th annual summit. But the full criteria and information as to how to nominate someone for the Hall of Fame is online. And um, last year, we received more than 50 applications, uh, nominations for the Hall of Fame. So it is a selective group of women um, with kind of lifelong contributions to the industry. And we assume that we will have an amazing response again this upcoming year of more women to be considered. Uh, that, uh, that's, that's incredible. So I know we're, we're getting close to time here. But we've got two questions for you. The, the last one's going to be the shameless plug, you know, and, and, and giving people all the URLs and all the ways that they can get involved. But the other one, I think, is going to be the toughest one. So, you know, say that, that, that I'm a young woman, maybe starting my career in manufacturing or maybe thinking about getting into a career in manufacturing, and I want to be in that Hall of Fame one day. What is the, the 30 second advice that you would give that young woman? So I think if I was to speak to that young woman, I would share that um, for as she's in her career, to know that there's lots of others that have been there who are willing and very um, able to help lend guidance and support and to provide um, lots of resources along the way. And then I think as it relates to their future induction, if they're aspiring to be that trailblazing woman, I think it's for that person to not only think about navigating their own career, but to support the people that come after them. So for themselves to pay it forward and to be an advocate and to be a mentor and ambassador for others. So I think we all um, professionally want to aspire to do great things, but I would encourage that person to think about the others that they get to work with and again, that fill positions that report to them or, or, or are part of their organization. You know, think about how you can help those people have a bright and wonderful future. Yeah, I think that's extremely salient advice, you know, but I'd also venture to say no matter who you are or what you're trying to do, that is a great, great philosophy to take. Um, Dana, uh, do you have any, any suggestions there being, you know, a, a woman in the manufacturing sector? You know, I, was hoping, I was hoping you weren't going to say being an older woman. 
never. No, no. That, uh, you know, I, I was thinking about that as Allison was talking, and she gave great tips. But I think the other thing I would say to a younger person is, you know, be yourself. Don't try to be, if, if you're, especially as you're getting ingrained in a culture and in an um, industry that is dominated by other types of people than you. Uh, and this would, I think, hold true of anybody that was getting into, you know, be yourself because it's those, the different frame of thought that you bring is what's going to make an impact. So don't be afraid to, um, you know, bring that energy and that passion that you have that may be a little bit different than what you see modeled because that's really what's going to make a difference. Um, and I think that uh, ties to, to like one thing that I think I really got from from both of you and, and it was super inspiring to me was also embrace, embrace and get excited about a challenge too. You know, <laughs> that, uh, and, well, Dana, I know you pretty well, so I know that, that is you to a T, but like Allison, the fact that that was like one of the first things you said, um, you know, I, I think it's been an incredible conversation. You know, and I couldn't think of think of a better way to kick this off. And, and Dana, thanks for getting it, it set up. And Allison, obviously, thanks so much for being the first guest for this series because, like I said, I don't think we could have imagined a better one. Um, you know, so so that said, here's the shameless plug, Allison. If, if, if I'm looking to get involved with women in manufacturing, where do I go? What do I do? What's the first step? So our website would be the best resource. So it's womeninmanufacturing.org. And there you can find information on how to join the organization, how to participate in any of our programs or services. And I would encourage any of those as well who are um, individual students or people kind of considering a future career. We have a very low cost student membership and you get all of the same benefits as our professional members. So it's less than a few trips to Starbucks. I think it's $20 or $25 total as an annual um, membership. And it's well worth it because you have access to our full directory, um, women you can connect with for mentorship and advice. Uh, and as well, that same benefit resolves or resides with our individual membership as well. And then for companies, my, my plug would be if you're if you're along your way in your DE and I journey or you're looking for a partner resource, we are very um, excited to work with companies like that who either um, currently are, are working on kind of female attraction and retention and advancement, as well as those just getting started. So we've got lots of resources for all types of companies and we'd love to work with many organizations or more organizations present day. Yeah. So whether you're you're an individual or a company, you know what to do now. Yeah. So, all right, Allison. Well, again, thank you so much. Uh, this was an incredible conversation. Again, yeah, you know, super excited that we're we're able to run this women, you know, transforming manufacturing series, and we got to kick it off with the person who was brought to reality, one of the foremost organizations helping, you know, kind of inspire others to pursue that mission. So. Thank you so much, Allison, Dana. As always, great to have you. Great to see you. And we'll, uh, we'll talk to everybody soon. Great, thanks.